Our first speaker is our extension veterinarian located in Fargo. His name is Dr. Charlie Stoltna, and Charlie's been with us for quite a few years now, and we've asked him to uh, talk about some issues that we had last year uh, dealing with environment, both heat and cold stress. So from that, Charlie, if you'd like to um, enlighten us on your perspective on stresses that occurs in the cow herd due to environment. Charlie, good morning. Good morning, Carl. Um, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to come in on what has turned out to be the coldest day of the year, but it's also the first day I think we dipped below zero. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, this has been a wonderful winter. I think uh, we're going to get into it. I just want to, there are two handouts that I sent out. Uh, one of them is a presentation, and it's entitled Temperature Stress. The other one is three pages, and we will cover that or go over that second or last and these are the actual this is the actual policy from USDA FSA in North Dakota each of the local FSA uh, districts or offices actually do their own type of recommendations for cold hot LIP payments and so uh, we'll do that second so anyway I'm going to try and switch this over to see the uh, there we go. Hey, temperature stress. As Dr. Lardy, the, many of you already know, is the department head, he has a saying. Um, he doesn't exhibit stress, but he is a carrier. And so uh, that's why I like to try and tell my students out there, I, I don't exhibit stress, but I am a carrier of it. So we're going to focus mainly today on temperature stress. If you have some questions, uh, please feel free at the end to uh, ask them. Now, how many of you seen these? Um, this this actually is on the left, the extremes. This actually is the head. I don't know if you can see my little, cur yeah, you can see the cursor move there. Here's the ear tag. But look at that thing. That that animal is encased in snow and ice. And on the right-hand side, though, we see that uh, um, this is open mouth breathing. And actually, this animal is from uh, North Dakota, and I'll be very honest with you, if you look closely at the ear tag, uh, it's a, um, it says CREC on that ear tag, and I think a few individuals recognize where that animal comes from. And so uh, that was just taken this past uh, summer in about July. We had a field day, I think it was July, about in there, a field day up there, and it was a hot day. Okay, so when we talk about you know, heat stress or cold stress, you have to understand uh, thermal regulation, and, and that's the body of the, that's the temperature of the body of the animal. And very simply, the two primary ways that we think of, of modulating temperature in animals, if they're hot, they sweat. If they're cold, they shiver. And staying in, you know, using these two mechanisms is what we call homeostasis. And homeostasis is that animal's temperature should be about 100 and a half, 101, somewhere around there. Um, you know, also, also the concept of thermoneutral zone. Uh, this is the zone that the animal's in where it really doesn't have to expend much energy, either to stay warm or to stay cool. And so this is also where the animal uses the least amount of energy uh, for its own uh, maintaining its own body functions and so if we can keep an animal in those zones that's where the most efficient cost of gain is or how you look at the efficiency of the animal so uh, just a little chart here to show you uh, on the bottom is temperature and on the left hand side is the amount of calories it takes to uh, that animal to stay in its thermal neutral zone so you see there's a th TNZ is the thermal neutral zone and that as uh, as as we increase in heat uh, some of our uh, uh, feed intakes uh, will will increase um, uh, I, sorry as, as we look at heat um, as the hotter we get um, our intakes start to decrease the amount of calories we have uh, the amount of maintenance energy required in and at one point in time, we're going to cross where we can't, we're, we're losing weight. And we also know that on the cold side, if you look on the left side, there comes a point in time where we can't feed these animals enough for them to maintain the weight they have. 
And so that's just the, the concept of uh, thermal regulation and the, the effect of nutrition and uh, trying to keep that animal you know, in condition, not losing weight, uh, becomes really important in the feedlot and also in our cow-calf you know, uh, herds. So we're going to talk about cold stress first. So here's that same slide. The point is, as we get colder, the maintenance requirements for these cattle starts to increase. Eh, that's pretty simple. But probably what you weren't aware of, and you know, I, I forget this from time to time, is how sensitive um, these animals are to temperature. We view them as being pretty durable out there. You know, they do, they do pretty well. Yeah, they're doing fine. Uh, Carl and I were, uh, Dal and I were just talking this morning about cattle. We have such a what we look as a mild winter, and yet we've got some cows still out on pasture. But is that the place best for them? And I think Carl might be addressing some of that later. Uh, just because it's a mild winter to us doesn't mean it is to them. So what this slide shows, what are the critical temperatures? You know, that animal that has a summer coat, um, or we get an animal that gets wet and we take away the insulating uh, characteristics or capacity of the, the hide and the hair, the critical temperature now is 59 degrees. As they get a longer hair coat, like the fall coat, the critical temperature when they start moving out of their thermal neutral zone is about 45 degrees. A winter coat, probably what they've had in December this year, because we really didn't have a lot of temperature to drive the drive their hair growth, we're about 32 degrees. And in the heavy winter coat, uh, the critical temperature resides at about 18 degrees. So if we look at what we're feeding these animals then. Uh, so we said 18 degrees was the lowest, uh, was the critical temperature, so let's just round it to 20. So if you have, uh, uh, you're at uh, 20 degrees and um, we have a 0% increase in what we need to feed them, their total uh, TDN requires about 12 and a half pounds. And you can see from the chart there as we start dropping the temperature, uh, and that's a combination of cold and wind. You can see the increase requirements for energy. So the example there is that for every one degree below the critical temperature equals about a one to two percent increase in <laughs> TDN. Um, and Carl was reminding me, he helped me a lot with this uh, presentation so he's sliding a sign over that says really nice slides actually they are much nicer than the ones he had um, <laughs> but the point is as you drop in temperature your nutrient requirements increase so as an example if you go uh, from an effective temperature of 20 degrees and you drop down to negative 5 degrees Fahrenheit and you have a 10, a 10 mile per hour wind effectively your temperature is negative 22 degrees. Well, if you look in the chart, that means that you need to increase that ration for that animal by about 40%. So that becomes 17 and a half pounds of TDN. Figure out the calculations. Uh, 36 and a half pounds dry matter equals about 40 and a half pounds as fed. And that's just simply dry, dropping from 20 degrees above uh, to uh, a five degrees below with a 10 mile an hour wind. So you can imagine really how much energy is sapped out of these cows out there uh, who are gestating and we're moving them along and we want them to maintain condition and we're wondering, you know, are they performing well or not? Gives you an idea of just how much energy it takes out there. So when we deal with stress, cold stress and you know as we looked at that hair coat water takes away insulating capabilities and so that that poor animal we saw on that title slide with totally encrusted in snow and ice does not have much insulation anymore because that hides wet the hair is wet and uh, that temperature is going right through the other thing about cold stress Carl we were hoppy we were visiting a little bit before the we started this on windbreaks. 
and in here in North Dakota where we live wind is a real killer literally and figuratively uh, wind is a, a real problem for us um, and then betting uh, I do know that there is some debate on whether people should bet or not I am a big fan of betting animals uh, I think one is I'm going to show some data that came out of Carrington on performance but two I think more than that we're moving into an era that we really have to be good stewards as an industry of how we take care of these animals and maybe on a spreadsheet it looks like betting isn't the best way to go but I that sentiment will not be shared by the people who buy our products so I really uh, think we need to get uh, really serious about our use of bedding but what bedding does is it decreases the thermal exchange with the ground because that ground is 20 30 below it, that temperature and what we want to do is is give some insulation there Two, it helps the animals get down allows because if there's no bedding they don't want to lay down uh, get them out of the wind and uh, and also um, I think I've increased this one tabbed in one too far you have to keep water available I'm going to talk a little bit about that and also <clears throat> Uh, increasing the roughage content of the feed because what we want to do is use that rumen to generate heat uh, use everything we can to help that animal out there so cold stress keep things dry on the in the upper left hand oh, we have a building that's got a roof over it but as you notice how in a storm or a blizzard we see that snow curls right around underneath the edge and can deposit up quite a bit of snow or uh, water content within the, the barns and so you need to deal with that uh, if you look at the top right we've got all those manure tags on um, you know obviously they were muddy at one point in time uh, there wasn't enough area for them to get clean uh, the lower left hand look at that that is looks like about October weather to me maybe on the stucca operation I don't know that's uh, that's uh, pretty pretty wet up in that Cooperstown area uh, and then if you look at the lower right um, you know we're, we're trying to keep these animals uh, clean and, and dry because uh, water moisture uh, really saps the heat on them and also talking about keep things dry we're not really talking much about environmental uh, the whole thing about you need plenty of air movement uh, to keep down the the possibility of respiratory disease too moist in the environment just sets up a real pneumonia wreck for us so they do better um, uh, they do better in the cold than they do in the warm uh, semi moist in the winter time uh, this this research comes out of uh, a Carrington and we looked at uh, these were um, on the upper left hand look at average daily gain the blue there's no bedding the yellow is modest bedding and the red is generous bedding and that's two times modest and they were using growing heifers fed October through March and if you look at the average daily gain yes uh, there seem to be uh, more gain with the bedding uh, but if you look at net return in the lower right hand the cost well if you didn't bed there was no cost there so your costs were to me were fairly minimal and in this year uh, the year that this was done the cattle market was good and it was profitable uh, um, so again you can also find studies out there that say well betting may not pay especially in a, a feedlot top type operation uh, that may be but again I think we have to take more into consideration here than just the strict pennies and dimes another thing about cold stress as I said is is to block the wind and uh, we've seen way too many pictures like we do on the left you know that's a cold environment on the upper right hand uh, this operation is using um, round bales in kind of a temporary fashion actually I'm a big fan of this type of uh, uh, windbreak and one of the reasons is is it fits into North Dakota because we have the extremes we have extreme cold and we have extreme heat in the extreme cold we want uh, a windbreak and in extreme heat we don't want anything to impede a uh, wind movement and so anything that we can put a windbreak but also have the ability to take it down or move it uh, so we don't have it in the summer months I view that as a real positive 
On the left hand side is a little more uh, durable, uh, made with steel and piping, which is good. However, I think you're going to find, depending on the location, a fence like that could also stop and hold a lot of snow right in your operation or right in your pens. And that, that's a real downside to a solid type fence. On the right hand side, uh, I, I th this one allows, we break the wind, but we also allow some air to pass through and that actually will carry that snow farther. It slows it down, but not enough that it actually deposits and will keep that snow moving on out of the lots. That's the uh, actually intent of that design. So if you look at the upper left hand picture, the, the use of the shelter belt, and again, before we um, started this uh, presentation, there's a little discussion. The question is about how high do you need for a windbreak? And and the other way to look at this, uh, this, this chart shows that the wind is moving from left to right. And so in that purple zone, uh, just before it hits the shelter belt, um, so if you have trees that are 30 feet high, at about 300 feet high to about 60 feet out away from the shelter belt, that that speed of that wind is 65 to 95 percent, and then it drops to about 35 to depending on the velocity all the way up to 95. But as that w wind goes up over the trees, you'll notice that there's actually a zone of turbulence from about five to ten times the height of the shelter belt. And if you watch, you know, Discovery Channel and how the wings of an airplane when the when the when the air comes over that foil, it creates a circular uh, turbulent zone there that's actually got quite a bit of wind speed. But then there's like a sweet spot from about 10 to 15 times the shelter belt height, where it's the most calm. And then out past 15 to out that 30 times the height of the shelter belt, now we we have reduced speed, but they're starting to pick up again. So as you think about designing your um, shelter belts about how high to put them how far away from the fences uh, this is the type of information that you should take into consideration i think this comes out of midwest planning um, there's a title at the bottom of there where to its call number so you can if you want more information on how to do those uh, you know or consult with your your engineer so as we looked at cold temperature stress we see that there's an increased need for energy. Uh, we also see a decreased uh, feed intake. And, you know, people think, well, in cold, you don't need much water. Uh, that would be wrong. We've, we've run into a couple cases where we've had uh, people feeding high moisture, like beet pulp, high moisture rations that on paper supply enough um, water that they don't really need to supply open water. However, when you drop in temperature, feed intakes will drop also. And if feed intakes drop, then you're not consuming enough water. And if you don't consume enough water, feed, drop, feed intake drops even more. It's a, it becomes a really vicious cycle. It's a downward spiral, and these cows cannot recover. Uh, so you need to have, when you, we move into really cold weather, you really have to have a source of open water for them. And then also with cold associated injuries, you know, frostbite, the hooves, the tails, the ears. Um, there's no real good way to treat these, so it all comes down to prevention. You have got to got to bed, get them out of the wind. We we have to do think about these things before they occur because once they occur, they're just like an open wound. There's no way to sew it up. There's no way to make it heal better. Uh, the damage is the damage, and really not much we can do to it. The other one that we see uh, last year we got caught, two years ago we got caught, is male sterility. You have to, you know, we're having a lot of bull sales these days, and and they're uh, been examined and they're breeding sound. However, we can have some cold weather, March and April, and that's spermatozoa. It takes 30 days to mature, uh, and if we have too cold a weather. Uh, depending on when that cold snap is, uh, we can have just semen damage or we can actually have testicular damage. And so it's a good thing. We think these, these bulls are really tough out there. But again, this is where bedding comes in so they can get down and get some straw around them and cover up and uh, keep things functioning. 
Again, we talked about keep things dry, uh, block the wind, and use bedding. Then the other thing we saw, which we did have a problem, this, uh, is the other extreme is heat stress. And to manage heat stress, uh, there's there's about three, there's a, actually the USDA out there has a really good site with a lot of information on it, but the first one is identify the animals that are most at risk. And we always think of feedlot animals, right? We've heard of cows or cattle going down in the feedlot, so the heaviest feedlot animals. Uh, if you look at physiologically, they're overweight. Uh, the other thing is that they have decreased uh, lung capacity. It turns out, you know, Cattle are big, but if you compare them to humans, cattle have about only 25% the lung capacity that people do. And you're thinking, well, it's hot out, but it's not too bad for me. Well, that's true for you. But if we took away 75% of your lung capacity and made you uh, stand out in the hot humidity, uh, then you get a better idea of what this animal is going through. The other ones are the very young and the very old uh, you need to think about. And then color. Uh, some work have been done down in Florida using the actually same line of genetics, but they were able to, uh, through the use of breeding, they were able to have a black-hided herd and a white-hided herd, but with the same genetics, and they came up with about a two-degree uh, two degree core body temperature difference uh, just from the, um, when in the really hot weather. So color of the animal does make a difference. So if you have a feedlot of 1,000 pound black cattle out there and you know that you're going to be running into 95 degrees and 80 percent humidity, I think you uh, you better think be thinking proactive about this. And we also lost a number of cows uh, this last summer out on, out on um, pasture. And the commonality in those situations this summer was no shade, and two, limited access to water. And those two combinations are a killer. And so the action plan is water capacity. The literature gives, says that you need about two inches, in hot weather you need two inches of linear uh, space per animal. So for 200 head, you need 400 inches of like a water tank. 400 inches for so in the winter time you're thinking I want as little water of it open because I don't want to deal with frozen water lines but in the summer you have to think a complete opposite you need access to water and so if you can figure out how to have extra waterers available in the summer or if you got hot weather weather coming getting some plastic tanks or something out there but you need to spread out the water they can they can stand a lot if they've got access to water the second thing is if we, a lot of people feed in the mornings, that also means that peak ruminal activity occurs about 2, 3 in the afternoon, just when the heat is. So you might want to think about moving in during the really hot weather, move your feeding time to the evening. Uh, get rid of the windbreaks or open them up. That's why I said I like the uh, temporary ones or the bales that as we feed them, the windbreak disappears and you need to have some uh, some access to any breath of wind you can. That's why we, another reason we put mounds in our feedlots, not just to get away from the water in the valley, but also to give them a little height there so if there's any breeze, uh, they can uh, get access to it. Some uh, areas, especially farther south, cool the ground using sprinklers. The point is you want to turn those sprinklers on before we get the cattle stressed. Uh, we want to cool the ground, we want to cool the cattle, and at this time, with the really hot weather, water, you know, mud puddles are not a bad idea. And then shade, if you have it, one thing up here is you can provide shade, but then the winter blizzard comes and blows the whole thing away. So what do you do after that? I know that uh, I can tell you from personal experience, my brother runs a um, thousand head feedlot. And what they did this past summer was they actually opened the gates and put them under the trees. Uh, to move them out, and they move them out early when it's cool. They did not move them. Uh, look at the bottom. Don't work cattle. You don't want to do this at three in the afternoon. Uh, so they put up temporary electric fence, and they turned them out under the trees, and it worked well for them. And the other thing is provide bedding. And I think the stuff I saw said that if you roll out straw bales, 
or round straws on black dirt, you can effectively drop the temperature 15 degrees of what they're laying on just by that simple move. Then you can also uh, wet the straw down. I think the, the operative word here is wet down, not soak, because if you soak it, then you take away the insulating properties of the straw and you're going to get, you know, that hot heat is going to percolate right out of that ground, right through that uh, uh, soaked straw right into the animal again. But the idea is what we want to do is we want to give them as much temperature relief any way we can. And so bedding also is a good way to do that. And again, do not work your cattle. You're too late if you got to respond at 3 in the afternoon to something like this. And then the other step three is know when to intervene. And this is driven by temperature and humidity. There's a heat index. And actually, I've supplied you with the heat index and also the frost or the, the, uh, the cold index, for lack of a better term, in that other handout. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. However, the heat index, it's cumulative. And the problem is, especially for cattle, this ruminant, is they can't cool down. If the temperature doesn't drop enough during the evenings, they can't cool off between hot days. So if you look at the USDA livestock, uh, the LIP program eligibility, <clears throat> the way it works is uh, they, will, they will allow a claim if the heat index was greater than or equal to 75 for 72 hours, that's three days prior to death or the heat index during the 48 hours prior to death was no lower than 79 during the day and no lower than 75 during the night. And the, or the heat index was greater than or equal to 84 for two consecutive days. And this is, this is North Dakota FSA policy. Uh, the point though here is rarely do we get surprised by hot weather. Uh, we can usually see it coming. And so these are the things you need to get ready for instead of trying to react to uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We know they're coming. Uh, we need to get a game plan together here because prevention, we need to pre prevent it rather than react to it. So here's some pictures of, you've seen this, heat stress is normal. This, this animal's in its you know, thermal neutral zone. It's, it's happy. Stage one of heat stress is elevated breathing rate. They're, they can become restless. Uh, they increase time standing, okay? At stage two, we have uh, elevated breathing rate. They start to drool. The saliva starts coming out of their mouth. Again, they're standing, they're restless. Uh, they can't get comfortable. At stage three, we still have the, the breathing rate is up. Excessive drooling now. It's, it's no secret. Uh, most of the animals are standing. And it's interesting, when they get hot like this, now they want to start standing by each other. They start to group up, which only compounds the problem. At stage four, uh, we have the breathing rate. Now we got open mouth breathing. Uh, they're drooling. The animals group together. Stage five, now we actually have abdominal breathing. You see the sides back by the rumen, be, beyond the, the, the rib cage and the abdomen area, that's moving in and out. They are trying to move air as fast as they can. The mouth is open, the tongue is sticking out, they're drooling, they're standing, restless. And then we're almost to the bitter end. This is stage six, open mouth, very abdominal breathing, labored, their head is down. And these animals have gone off by themselves to die. They move away. And we're way too late in the game on these. And you got to be really careful on these. These are not the ones you want to try and get up and run around at all. Uh, these, these ones are, you know, can you, without spooking them, can you put shade over them, start blocking that heat on them. Uh, but we're too far here. We should have intervened before we got to this stage. So if you want to take out your the other handout, and just wanted to show you this, um, this is the heat index, and this is on the last page of that USDA. And these are these are just copies of the pages out of the USDA book. But notice this is how you figure the heat index, and uh, we looked at uh, 75 or greater. So if you look at a heat index at 75, you could be the temperature is only. Um, 
81 degrees dry bulb and your relative humidity is 50 percent you'll hit that 75 uh, heat index so if you're at that for three days uh, this is where USDA says well we we were you know they'll consider uh, eligibility here and then if you look at the daytime heat index reaches 84 or higher for two consecutive days also well, that would be about 92 degrees Fahrenheit at about 55 percent relative humidity so that's how you read that chart and then this other one the wind chill chart this is the actual chart on the first page of that handout uh, the second website is there's a calculator it says this is that actual chart this is the chart USDA looks at to determine what the wind chills were in your area and they have the end on stations are located across the state so if a producer out there is going to make a claim or anything like that they can actually go and those end on stations this is what USDA will access uh, to look the, look up that uh, eligibility criteria so I think that's the last no no we got one more yeah see and and that's and this is the way Dr. Stucka takes care of his cattle um, he has rented some land some beachfront on Cabo San Lucas he flies the cattle down um, usually in the beginning of November they'll come back uh, about May 1st and uh, no so um, I'm done with mine I if we have any questions I'll try and answer them um, the thing about my position I like to really engage others and defer basically I don't know the answer but I have three others here that really do so uh, let me uh, we'll take it back to you Carl thank you Charlie um, I have a question for you when it deals with the heat stress and we'll I'll ask this while other people are asking or figuring out if they have any questions to ask so they can ask how long does it take a calf to go from in North Dakota in some of these hot days we had last summer how long does it do you expect to take them to go from stage four heat stress to, to stage six heat stress is it, there it's going to be th there is no thumb uh, rule of thumb because you have the difference in environmental conditions um, I, so uh, if you have a stage four heat stress at three o'clock in the afternoon, are we going to see stage six? Sta I can't say this. <laughs> are we going to see stage six before we get some evening cooling? I mean, that's the risk people have dealt with over the years up here. We rarely gets that hot enough to see that much heat, but last year we got caught in a few areas. So right. I'm trying and to get a feeling for for that. And and the answer comes back to. Every animal is going to have a different biological susceptibility. Some are able to be more heat tolerant than others. So no, I can't give you a time because that's the progression. If they have any, uh, I do remember when I was young, we actually had some uh, cattle with Santa Gertrudis in them in our feedlot. We're just trying them out. And in the summertime, man, they handled the street, the heat so much better. So I can't. It, it, you've got too much genetic and biologic variability to give you a rule of thumb. But I will ask Dr. Stucka, since he's got more feedlot, uh, uh, any idea. But uh, uh, Do Carl Dahlin also mentioned, he says, it also depends on what the previous days were. Because remember, they have to be able to cool down in the evening. And if you've already had two days of this, you got you got a big problem. Versus if it's the first day, you know, you might be able to get away with it. <clears throat> yeah, Carl, I think that's right. I, I mean, if, if the conditions remain what they are, when you've got one in those various stages, they will continue to progress if the conditions remain what they're, what's causing in the first place. I mean, if you can possibly get a little cooling in there, if the wind comes up, or if you can somehow cool them off with a little sprinkling, it changes that whole equation. But the progression is in place, and if it, if the animal is unable to dissipate its internal core body temperature, then you will progress. But I have no idea necessary. I can't give you a real, real answer as to how quickly that will occur. And and like Charlie says, each animal is going to be a little bit different. Are there any other questions from other some of the other locations? I have one here I have from. A uh, I have. Is that? 
once you start seeing that panning, I mean, how do you, I mean, if you haven't got shade available, is your best bet to try to get a water truck with a hose on them? Can you shock them? I mean, how do you try to bring those animals back and, and pull them back from, from death's door? I mean, I mean, I know that once you get them in that last stage, you're probably, or they're probably already dead, but, but how do you try to bring them back when you start seeing the panning in those signs? <laughs> well, one of the big things is not so much the, the shock of the cold, but just, just you know, they call the fire department up, and what it does is it riles them up more than it, it helps. Yeah. And so, um, like I said, if you can, if if you can just get more water in the pen, you know, and if they can get up on their own and start to consume some water, or if you've got it, hopefully you don't have 50 of them laying out there. If you have just a couple of them, you know, some type of temporary wind uh, sunshade just to take the heat off of them because they're going to be pretty lethargic. I mean, if you approach them and they get up, well, then get some water out there. Give them access. Try something there, but don't, don't, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of calling the fire department out on this because you also get a lot of people who like to get things riled up, and that's the last thing you want to do. We have one other question. Go ahead. Was there another question? No, I was just going to ask uh Jerry, because he does a lot of work down in Kansas and Oklahoma and how they handle it down there. You know, one of the disadvantages that we have compared to some of those high plains feed yards is that that gets us is the humidity issue. So a lot of those feed yards in western Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas, they can handle greater heat uh, because they don't have the humidity. The, the thing that gets us is the humidity deal. And... Um, I mean, desperate, desperate situations require sometimes desperate solutions. And when Charlie mentioned turning the cattle out, I mean, and I know not everybody can do this depending on the size of your feedlot because now you've got pens mixed up and everything, and it's, it's chaos. But you have to start thinking in terms of populations. Okay, I'm going to lose some cattle here, but can I save the majority of them, and I'm going to lose some efficiency and some gain for a while? I mean, that's the kind of thinking you have to start um, putting into place because otherwise you're going to have 50 dead ones or 100 dead ones or more. And so that turnout so that animals can take advantage of just some simple things like shade and or wind can make all the difference in the world. Uh, question. Uh, if you're breeding during some of this hot cycle, I'm taking they're not breeding, you're going to get some open cows, um, you could exasperate you're, I'm imagine your bulls aren't going to feel much like riding those cows. Oh, actually, we saw some uh, some of the evidence this past summer. Is uh, Carl Dahl and I did a little kind of a quick study with some of the local or the veterinary practices out there, and the first breeding cycle went pretty darn well in June. But when we came back and looked at the pregnancy results out of those the next two cycles in that July August. Uh, they took a real beating. Carl, you have more comments on that? Uh, well, depending on your, your breeding management, too, if you're trying to use an uh, artificial insemination or something like that, I mean, we, we ran into pretty much a train wreck this year because um, we had one of our breedings scheduled for those hot days. So in the morning, those cattle that we bred there, they were fine. Those ones that we bred in the afternoon, their pregnancy rates got cut by about half and you could feel this going into those cows you could just feel that they were hot and anticipate there was going to be problems and like Charlie said that followed all the way through with the um, the bull performance during those peak days and that's not necessarily just a function of those bulls not doing their job it's also a function of that embryo developing inside that cow and uh, stress of any kind if this is somebody standing next to the chute hitting every one of them with a hot shot if it's running them across the pasture whatever stress of any kind and heat stress in this particular case uh, really impacts the implantation of those embryos so um, you know all the stuff that Charlie said about shade and water importance with your feedlots that, that really translates into your cow herds as well uh, especially if you're breeding during that peak stress